Okay, so uh, so first, uh, let me thank the uh, the organizer for their kind invitation here in Nata. I'm very happy to be here, and uh, uh, I'm have a few minutes to uh, to present you uh, our work on the uh, observation of uh, what we call an intranet cell uh, magnetism in the Chittagap state of uh, uh, ITC uh, cuprate superconductors. So my name is Ivan Sidis. I'm working at the Laboratoire Léon Bourouin in Saclay at a few kilometers from, uh, from Paris. So, um, okay. Can we go up and down? No, no, no. Ah, it's, ah, that's not working, so I will do it by hand. Okay, so uh, this work has been done in, uh, in uh, has been done in the group of, uh, of Philippe Bourges uh, in, uh, in Saclay, and uh, uh, we have a lot of collaboration uh, with many groups over the world, the, 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 the group of uh, Bernard Keimer at the Max Planck Institute in Stuttgart, uh, the group of uh, uh, Martin Graven at the Minnesota University, and uh, we have uh, recently initiated a new collaboration with the group of uh, uh, Véronique Vouet uh, in uh, Saclay at the Laboratoire de Philippe Solides, uh, not on cuprate but uh, uh, on, uh, on iridate. So here you have the general phase diagram of, uh, of cuprate. Uh, Mathieu has just introduced uh, the, uh, the key feature. I just briefly remind you a uh, few things. So uh, we start with a, 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 a molten solator stage. We dub the system. And uh, after uh, a small amount of uh, dub hole in the copper to plane, the system becomes at low temperature uh, superconductors with an unconventional superconductivity, dual superconductivity. But when you move in the normal state, properties are not those accepted for a conventional metal, especially below uh, a line here in temperature that's called T star, the system uh, develops very anomalous properties, and in particular on certain portion of the Fermi surface, which are called the antinodal uh, portion of the Fermi surface, uh, it develops a gap, or there is at least a depletion of the density of, uh, of uh, state. So there is anomalous property here below uh, this T star uh, line, where we enter into the gap phase, and when you cool down the temperature between T star and Tc, there is an intermediate phase uh, where a charge order develops. So here, in the absence of field or pressure, this uh, uh, charge order is essentially incipient, it's short range and quasi 2D, and it's characterized by a D wave form factor. That means basically, if you have a charge order, it's essentially on the uh, uh, oxygen uh, side. So uh, at this temperature here, when the charge density wave develops, eventually you have indication that translation invariance uh, could be broken. But at T star, much higher temperature, when you really enter the Chilliard state, translation symmetry, uh, the translation symmetry is preserved. So the question is, how do you open a uh, gap in certain portion of the Fermi surface, but in the same time, you keep the uh, lattice translation invariance uh, untouched? So in addition, there are some indications from uh, uh, many uh, experiments, for instance, ultrasound measurements, some thermodynamic uh, uh, proof that uh, there are also um, uh, there, there could be also an uh, order, uh, a phase which break uh, some symmetry, which could also develop at T star. So in that case, that means we know that at T star there should exist also some phase, which preserve the translation invariance, also break some symmetry. The question, what kind of symmetry could be broken at T star? So here I'm going to focus on uh, one proposal, which was made at the end of the 90s by Chandra Varma, which, who essentially uh, postulated the existence of a magnetoelectric state where you have uh, loop currents running from copper to oxygen. Here, this is what we call the CC theta two phase, where you have two loop currents along the diagonal, uh, turning clockwise and anticlockwise. So this phase breaks the, the parity and the time reversal symmetry, but it preserves the translation uh, invariant. And this phase uh, is also characterized by the fact that there are uh, four loop current patterns, so there is a, 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 it's a fourfold degenerated uh, state. How can we observe that kind of uh, uh, loop current? Well, it's quite simple. If you have loop currents, you create orbital moments, which should be perpendicular to the plane. So you should expect two staggered magnetic moments per uh, copper uh, O2 uh, plaquette. So this is what we call in neutron scattering a Q equals zero anti-ferromagnetic state. So this is something which is quite easy to measure, actually. You can also characterize this loop current phase by some other parameter like a magnetic quadrupole or a, a, a magnetic uh, toroidal moment or anapole, which should be along the uh, diagonal here. So as an, I'm a neutron scatterer, I'm going to focus on the magnetic property of uh, this uh, uh, loop current uh, phase. 
So the kinetic moment you produce here is very tiny. And as I said, you preserve a translation invariant. So if you are able with your neutron scattering experiment to probe this magnetic signal, this signal would be extremely tiny. And since the translation invariance is preserved, the magnetic peak should show up on top of the nuclear peak because neutron probes magnetism and the nuclear structure simultaneously. So the main problem is how can you see something which is very tiny, three or four order of magnitude smaller than the underlying uh, nuclear uh, peak. So it's very challenging. By chance, we can use a, a, a polarized neutron beam where the spin of neutron is polarized. The nuclear signal will go up in what we call the non-spin flip channel. You don't flip the spin of neutron when you interact with the structure. On the contrary, when your neutron interacts with the magnetic property, the spin of the neutron flip and the signal show up in what we call the spin flip channel. So using a polarized neutron beam, you can disentangle the magnetic signal and the nuclear signal. Here you have the uh, uh, magnetic scattering pattern that we expect in the HK plane for the loop current. And you see that there are clearly some back position, like 1OL or O1L, where the signal should be pretty strong. So basically, the idea is you do your measurement as a function of temperature, and you look what happened in the, in the spin flip channel. So in the spin flip channel, we should see some background, which is just due to the fact that the polarization of your beam is not perfect. So there is always a leakage from the non-spin flip channel to the spin flip channel. This is the blue part here. And if you are lucky, at a certain temperature, which should be T star, you should expect a signal in addition to the channel, which is the magnetic signal. So this is the, 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 the cartoon which describes the, exp uh, the experiment here. And this is the measurement that we did in YBCO, here YBCO uh, with 12% uh, doping. At a certain temperature, which is no more than the T star temperature, the chill gap temperature, we observe on the bright O11 a magnetic signal. So that means that there is a magnetic signal exactly as expected in the uh, model proposed by Chandra Varma of uh, uh, loop uh, uh, current. And the signal we observe has exactly the same symmetry as the uh, loop current. So we have observed the signal here for 12 percent, but you see all the solid points here, which correspond to all the points where we have observed actually the signal, and the signal disappears at large doping when we are far away from the uh, end point of the pseudo gap uh, state. We have observed this, this, uh, this signal in, uh, in YBCO, but also in uh, four other cuprate family, like uh, a single layer Mercury 1201 or the uh, bilayer uh, Bismuth uh, 2212. Just to convince you that this is correct, here this is the, the uh, single layer Mercury 1201, where uh, for uh, this uh, uh, doping around 12%, uh, once again, you observe the magnetic signal here on the 1 o o uh, Bragg uh, reflection. In the meantime, on the same sample, you can measure the resistivity, and you see the change of the uh, resistivity exactly at T star. So the signal shows up exactly at T star and is associated to uh, the uh, Chiller gap uh, state. We can also do the measurement in BISCO. In BISCO, for instance, uh, we did the measurement on the 1 or 3 here in red in the Chiller gap state. Uh, what, uh, under the sample uh, UD85, and you clearly see the magnetic signal at a certain temperature, which is T star. You do the same measurement at larger doping, the signal is completely flat. There is nothing. So the signal is associated to the chill gap state. But you could also compare your neutron scattering data, which are bulk measurements, with some surface probe measurements. You take the RPS measurements, which done by Kavinsky 10 years before, and uh, you look at the internal position where the chill gap opened, and uh, you, you, uh, you use an RPS measurement where uh, the, um, uh, the beam is uh, uh, circularly polarized. So you can probe the existence of decorism. Decorism is something that you could observe is time reversal symmetry. So you observe a decorative effect when you are exactly in the underdog regime. But when you are outside the, uh, the pseudo gap uh, regime here, as in neutron scattering, everything is completely flat. So the two techniques, that the surface probe and the bulk probe, tell you exactly the same thing. Time reversal symmetry has to be broken at T star. So here you have the temperature in red where we observe our signal in BISCO blue with RPS measurements. Once again, there is a pretty good agreement between and RPS measurements. But you can see here there is some kind of plateau in the T star line. And that just tells us that maybe there are two kinds of regime in uh, uh, this uh, in itself, uh, magnetism. You can see that uh, when you look uh, more carefully at the uh, YBCO data. For instance, when you are uh, at uh, rather low doping, around 10%, you measure a large T star, and in the meantime, you have a magnetic intensity, which is n substantial. That means the magnetic moment is a typical order of 0.01 uh, Bohr magneton. And 
if you do, uh, for instance, a, a scan along the O1 direction to probe the correction lines along the C-axis, you see that the signal is essentially resolution limited. That just tells you that the correction lines along the C-axis associated to this intra-init cell magnetism are quite large. They are uh, at least 75 angstrom or infinity. That means we cannot probe. This is, we are dealing with something which is almost a 3D order, or close to be a 3D order. On the contrary, when you do the same measurements close to uh, uh, the optimal doping, here at around 15%, for instance, the situation changed. T star remains large, but the signal we probe with neutron scattering drops down. So the only way to understand that is just to see that the signal, which was here, oh, sorry, which was, uh, which was here on, the, on top of the Bragg peak, now is redistributed in phase space. That just means that you lower correction lengths. You are dealing with a signal which is short range. So the signal here is redistributed along the O1 direction, and you can really probe the magnetic signal away from the Bragg peak. So from this measurement and the cut we realize along the uh, 1 O direction, we can extract the correction lengths. Correction lengths are now the C axis, just one lattice spacing, so it's almost quasi 2D. And uh, uh, within the plane, we have a correction length, which is 20 lattice spacing, about uh, 75 uh, angstrom. So around optimal doping, the magnetism is still present, but we are dealing with something which is more quasi 2D and uh, short range. So this is something which is very useful for us, because that could help us to solve a very long, a very long uh, problem we had with local probe measurement. Indeed, if you observe a magnetic order, you should uh, generate a, a static field which can be probed by local probe measurement, USR, NQR, uh, NMR. But despite of many attempts, this field has never been observed. So basically, the only way to solve the issue, once again, is just to assume that we have perhaps a short range order, a finite side effect, and who say finite side effect may also say a finite time scale, because things can slightly, slowly fluctuate. So if you assume the magnetism we probe as a finite time scale, you just have to assume that the time scale is long enough to see the signal as being static for new scattering. But if you average on the time scale of your local probe, USR or NMR, the signal averages to zero, and you cannot observe it. By chance, this uh, technique could be refined, and you could look for something different, which is the detection of slowly fluctuating uh, local field, for instance, using uh, MUSR. This has been done recently in, uh, in YBCO. So if you uh, focus on the longitudinal field relaxation, this quantity tells you what is the magnitude of the slowly fluctuating field, but you can also extract to, uh, 2C, which is the characteristic time scale. So this kind of measurements were, were, was recently done in, uh, on YBCO for different dopings, and uh, in this measurement, they detected at low temperature a slowly fluctuating magnetic signal. And the characteristic time scale here is typically of the order of 5 to 25 uh, seconds, Twi which is this signal with tw 5 or 25 nanoseconds is essentially static at the time scale of neutrons. But here, it's clearly fluctuating. So we have something which slowly fluctuates. Okay, it doesn't mean that this signal is connected to the Tudor gap state. They did the same measurement. They probed the uh, longitudinal relaxation rate as function of temperature. And see here, there's a sudden change exactly at T star. And this is what you observe when you are dealing with a second order phase transition. Because when you approach the phase transition, you have lots of fluctuation, and you can pick up this fluctuation exactly at the transition. You saw it. Let's assume that this is the correct interpretation. You should do the same with neutron scattering. Instead of being on the, on the Bragg peak here, you just have to sit slightly away from the Bragg peak. And then when you cross the transition, you see suddenly the correction line changing. So what you should see in your spin flip channel, a sharp peak exactly at T star. This is what we have observed in YBCO, close to optimal doping, but also in Mercury 1201, deep in the uh, pseudogap state or close to uh, optimal uh, doping. That indicate that we are dealing with something which cohesively order in time and space. Can we call that an order? That's okay. But this is something which looks like critical fluctuation. Look like critical fluctuation. Are we sure that this signal is really magnetic? Because okay, we measure something in the spin flip channel, but it could be an artifact. So we have to prove that from our experiment that we're dealing with something which is just uh, an anomaly of the neutron scattering experiment. So when you do an, a neutron scattering experiment in the spin flip channel, you always see a signal, a magnetic signal. Uh, which has to be, uh, and the magnetic component has to be simultaneously perpendicular to Q, the transfer momentum, and perpendicular to the uh, neutron spin polarization. 
So if you are in this condition, you see the full magnetic signal. But by chance, you can also rotate the neutron spin polarization. In that case, the intensity in the spin field channel could be modulated. So if you, for instance, select three direction, uh, polarization parallel to Q, but also pol uh, polarization perpendicular to Q in the scattering plane or perpendicular to Q outside the scattering plane, you should see the intensity changing in the spin field channel. But when you do the, the sum of the intensity here and here, you should get the intensity there. This is what we call the polarization sum rule. When you have a polarization sum rule in your neutron scattering experiment, the signal is magnetic. You can take that for granted. This is the absolute proof, the textbook experiment. But you can also extract something more. That means you push the analysis a bit further and you can extract the component of your magnetic moment. Uh, how much of the signal is perpendicular to the plane or in the plane. So if there is a tilt of the magnetic moment, you should see it. In the loop current order, the magnetic moment has to be perpendicular to the copper rotor plane. Here we found an angle which is 55 degrees. So that means already a problem with the loop current order. But this is magnetic, for sure. Of course, we did the measurements on YBCO, on triple axis spectrometer, maybe we're quite unlucky and we pick up something. So let's repeat the same experiment on Mercury, oh sorry, on uh, uh, Mercury uh, uh, 1201, different sample, different instrument, a diffractometer D7 at ILL, different wavelengths, we change everything. But at the end of the day, the polarization sum rule is fulfilled. The signal is magnetic, it exists on another system. Once again, we can analyze the magnetic component and we found a tilt angle, which is here, of 70 degrees. Qualitatively, the same physics, quantitatively, slightly different. So, we can go through all the angles which have been found during the experiment. So, in one CO, you have a typical tilt angle of 45 per cent minus 20 degrees. Uh, in uh, uh, Mercury 1, 201, between 45 and 70 degrees. And in the case of BISCO, where the measurements were done close to optimal doping, between 20 and 0 degrees. So either this angle changes with the, uh, the with from one sample family to another, or maybe even evolve with doping. And it could be eventually related to the pseudograph itself. This is uh, an open issue, but we don't have the answer. What we can say for the moment is that this angle is temperature dependent. For the moment, if you take this YBCO sample close to optimal doping, you probe the evolution of the angle as function of temperature. At very high temperature, when you approach T star, magnetic moments are perpendicular to the plane, as expected for loop current order. When you pass through T star, the angle appears. So the tilt angle is related to T star by one way or another. So how can we interpret this tilt angle? That's something which is not straightforward. So if you work uh, with a planar loop current model, there are several uh, possibilities, but one which is uh, potentially interesting is the fact that uh, you can assume that at high temperature, you are in a classical limit, so you observe one of these four domains. Okay, moments are perpendicular to the plane. But once you enter in the pseudogap state, uh, it's not allowed to maintain this picture. You have to make a, a superposition of these four states. So this is the quantum superposition of these four loop current states, which produce the tilt angle. So the tilt ang uh, angle is not a true tilt of the moment. It's just uh, the way to highlight that your state is not pure. It's just a quantum superposition of different loop current states. Okay, this is one possibility. You can also assume that the loop current are delocalized on the uh, octahedra or on the pyramid in the bilayer system. That works quite well to a large angle, but that doesn't change with temperature. Uh, you could try some model on the oxygen, either with spin or uh, orbital moment. This good this symmetry. Uh, you can obtain any angle, but that's not the, okay, the, the interpretation we, uh, we keep in mind. And there is another interpretation which is quite nice. It's just to obtain the signal we, we have observed in neutron scattering in terms of combination of uh, different magnetic uh, quadrupoles. And each magnetic quadrupole has its own magnetic pa form factor as a function of uh, uh, L, uh, when you look at the wave vector uh, HKL. The problem is that this theory, first developed by uh, Lovese, tells you that the tilt angle should change each time you change L, 1 O L. And in, in particular, at L equals 0, the tilt angle should vanish. But we did the measurements on Mercury 1 to 1 at 1, 0, 0, high symmetry point, and we found a tilt angle. So we have to keep this interpretation, but we have to relax some constraint, especially some symmetry constraint, which were initially put by uh, Lovese uh, on the admixture of these two uh, quadrupolar order. Of course, the intranet cell order tells you that the uh, time reversal symmetry is broken, but maybe there is something else. For instance, if you uh, include in the description of this state some other measurements, like the torque measurements, which have been recently performed in Mercury 1 to 1, you find something new. That means this measurement is very powerful to probe 
to, to get some thermodynamic evidence of a, a, a nematic phase transition. That means the fourfold symmetry has to be broken. So when you take the uh, torque uh, coefficient here, uh, you should observe some uh, uh, oscillation uh, if nematicity uh, settles in. And uh, here you observe that uh, the modulation appears exactly at T star in the compound. And in the meantime, this is the modulation which corresponds to uh, a nematicity along the diagonal in Mercury 1201. Once you pick up the diagonal, immediately you want to make some connection with the loop current where the toroidal moment is also along the diagonal. That seems to be uh, uh, obvious. Unfortunately, from pure experimental point of view, when you repeat the same experiment, not on uh, Mercury 1201, which is a tetragonal system with a single layer, but you do the measurements on YBC, which is a bilayer system with a slightly autorhombic with copper, uh, copper oxygen chain along the direction. In that case, you also find an emeticity at T star, but now it's rotated at 45 degrees along the A direction. Essentially, this is uh, what you have uh, uh, here. That means you have to find a way to rotate your loop current, if you want to, to connect that with the, uh, uh, with the torque measurement. I will try to go fast. Here we can do the neutron scattering experiment on a system which is fully detween. YBCO 6.3 sample is fully detween. You do the measurement along the uh, 1 o, o direction, 0 1 o direction, you find a strong anisotropy. Here the A direction is much stronger. You change the L value, you go to uh, L equals 0 to L equals 1, 1, the anisotropy vanishes. So you find an anisotropy which is L dependent. L dependent just means you have a problem structure factor. Okay, you can change the uh, neutron polarization and you can uh, demonstrate that the anisotropy is carried by the magnetic component which is perpendicular to the plane, the one which should be produced by loop current. So it's quite simple. You take the bilayer structure, you take the different loop current patterns and you combine them and you see what kind of structure factor you can get. If you find uh, uh, a structure where the two, uh, the two loop, uh, loop current patterns are in phase, you have a toroidal moment along diagonal when you sum the two toroidal moments, no anisotropy. Out of phase, no uh, effective toroidal moment, no anisotropy. Once you do a crisscross ordering at 90 degrees, then you produce an anisotropy. The only structure which produces the, uh, the anisotropy which uh, is observed experimentally is this structure, where when you combine the two toroidal moments, the effective toroidal moment points along the B direction, the direction of the chain. So you can produce a strong anisotropy in the structure factor when you have this crisscross structure. First cross structure just means that you break the uh, uh, mirror plane of uh, the bilayer, exactly as the charge order which have been presented before uh, does. Second, we are dealing with a mag magnetoelectric uh, state. So imagine that you applied a field in the field copper to the effective toroidal moment, then you can create a polarization in the plane when the field is perpendicular to the plane. So maybe you can, when you apply a magnetic field, couple this order to the charge order and force a one-dimensional charge order to develop in a specific direction. The last but not the least is that YBCO is very peculiar. The oxygen is not exactly in the plane. So the, the oxygen is outside the plane. So you can slightly break this, this, the, the, the perfect symmetry of the copper root plane. And in that case, you see that you induce a ferromagnetic moment. So with the crisscross structure, when the toroidal uh, moment, effective toroidal moment is along B, a tiny ferromagnetic component appears along A which is a direction which is probed by the torque measurement. So this is the proof that you can rotate the, 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 the loop current order by combining two loop current patterns. So here's just to uh, uh, summarize, we have lots of indication that there are broken symmetries, uh, time reversal symmetries from neutron scattering, second harmonic generation uh, tells you that the parity is broken and the fourfold symmetry is broken according to torque measurements, Nernst coefficient and uh, also uh, STM. If I just take two of them here, the uh, second harmonic generation and polarized neutron, and then I repeat the same experiment in another system, uh, transition to uh, uh, iridium O4, the rhodium. It turned out that we found the same answer. Also in that system, which is very peculiar, which was introduced by Zilke uh, yesterday, uh, at a temperature which is called uh, T omega, a temperature at which a, s a mysterious hidden order showed up, and where, according to our best measurements, we have also indication of something which looked like a shadow gap, we see a phase which breaks parity, breaks time reversal symmetry, and according to the interpretation of what has been observed experimentally, it looks like a loop current order once again. To conclude very quickly, we have something which looks like an intra-in cell order. Maybe it's related to some form of uh, loop current. And this is a planar picture which to be 
to, to evolve a bit to, ac to account for the experimental data. We have maybe also some magnetic multipole, but once again, the in existing interpretation have to be fine. But the problem of all the interpretation is that this is a Q equals zero order. Q equals zero order doesn't open a gap. It cannot contribute to the opening of the Schrodinger gap itself. So if to understand or use this phase, which is observed experimentally, we have to think in a different way. We have to assume that how can we combine the Schrodinger gap metal with some broken symmetry space? And this is the approach that I like the most. I mean, you have to imagine that something opened the gap, but this is dressed with some phase which breaks specific symmetries. For instance, this is what is proposed when you do the loop current and the uh, Z2 topological order, a model proposed by Chatterjee uh, and uh, Sajdev in the emergent loop current order from PDW by Akterberg, uh, developed on the model of Patrick Lee, or more recently, the loop current order and emergent SU symmetry proposed uh, in the group by Catherine Pépin and uh, developed by um, Corentin uh, Maurice. So basically, you have to, f to, to see this intra cell order as some hallmark of a more general phenomenon which open the Tudor gap. But this is not this phase itself which opened the Tudor gap. Okay. This is a summary and you can read the main conclusion. So thanks for your attention. <laughs>